Okay, thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation to this uh, terrific workshop. Um, I am not part of the SPICE project. I'm also not Dutch, so I'm the uh, outlier in this uh, session. And actually what I want to do is uh, also on the topic, uh, still in the topic of applications for ultrafast magnetism, but uh, in a slightly different direction from uh, the photonic integration we've been hearing about. I want to talk about uh, ultrafast magnetics using uh, pure charge current. In fact, the idea is to move away from using uh, lasers and optical switching, but to take advantage of ultrafast magnetism physics for applications. So just want to acknowledge uh, the students and, postdoc and postdocs in my group who worked on this project and uh, my sponsors. So you've seen this picture before several times already during the course of this uh, meeting. Uh, the idea of applying ultra-fast all-optical switching to some kind of application like magnetic recording or now with the SPICE project, uh, this, this idea has advanced uh, quite a bit. Um, of course, the challenges are, uh, you know, make it using a commercial, commercializing the ultra-fast laser and uh, scaling this down to small uh, dimensions, nanoscale dimensions. There are solutions to all of that. These are uh, challenges, but I think uh, there's good progress on that. But I want to introduce uh, a slightly different perspective on ultrafast magnetism, and that's to look at the other uh, spintronic uh, world where we have uh, elect uh, spintronics, all, all electronics. So for example, like in MRAM. And the question is, could we take advantage of ultrafast uh, switching uh, in the electronics domain using electrical pulses for switching uh, magnetic materials. And here's a simple schematic for a memory device, but uh, one could imagine uh, going even further. Um, and I'll, I'll make some mention about that as, as we go along in this talk. So the sort of the dream that I started out with some years ago was to try to implement this, uh, get um, the equivalent of uh, the all optical switching process using, um, because it's a thermal process as we now know, very well know, uh, apply the energy in a short electrical pulse as opposed to a short optical pulse. Now, uh, why would we want to do that? Um, so if you look at STT-MRAM, it relies on precessional switching, which, as we've heard already a couple of times in this conference, uh, has some speed limits connected with the, uh, the, the dynamics of precessional switching. Now, for sdt MRAM, I think there's going to be a very nice talk tomorrow on engineering very cleverly the precessional switching to really minimize this and get the very fastest switching as, uh, as you can get in the neighborhood of uh, perhaps 100 picoseconds which would already be very attractive for uh, ultra-fast on-chip uh, uh, cache memory. Uh, that would make it competitive with SRAM, which is uh, currently the uh, technology that's on-chip for uh, the local cache memory. But um, if we can uh, have an even faster electronic-based magnetic memory, we could think of having every bit that's stored on a chip, for example, embedded throughout the logic, where you have flip-flops and registers and so forth. And you could really imagine integrating ultra-fast magnetic memory on the speed scale of the logic of the processor, which I'll show you is actually quite fast. So, of course, uh, everybody in here knows all about all, all optical switching in gadolinium iron cobalt. And uh, it happens on a very, very short time scale. Now, the question that I first started out with in this project was, what's the pulse width that you need to get gadolinium ion cobalt to switch? Because if I want to switch it electrically, if I have to generate a 100 femtosecond electrical pulse, that's not practical. On the other hand, if I can have that pulse be just a little bit longer, as you'll see, uh, it does turn out to be quite practical. So how short does the pulse actually have to be? So what we did was we did a, an experiment uh, back in 2016 where we, uh, you, we did all optical switching experiments. And it's very easy to stretch out the pulse from a regenerative amplifier. 
And we stretched out the pulse from the shortest that we could get out of our laser of 60 femtoseconds and stretched out the pulse to actually a little bit over 10 picoseconds. And what you see here, this is a conventional time-resolved MOC experiment in which you can see that indeed, as you stretch the pulse from 60 femtoseconds out to 10 picoseconds, okay, the switching time slows down correspondingly, but we could even get switching with a pulse width as long as, in fact, a little bit longer than that, uh, 15 picoseconds. So here's the time-resolved data. The thing that really surprised the heck out of us was that if you look at the minimum fluence required to switch, millijoules per square centimeter, as the pulse duration stretched out from 60 femtoseconds down uh, uh, all the way up to 15 picoseconds, the switching energy critical fluence increased by only about a factor of two. Now, this is really good news for the point of view of applications. I put this in here. Uh, many of you have probably seen me talk about this before, but I, I think this has important ramifications, which I haven't seen fully explored in terms of understanding the fundamentals of all optical switching. I think uh, yesterday we heard a talk on um, uh, you know, time-dependent DFT, which already gave us a new perspective on how the uh, all optical switching works. And any model that uh, we come up with for trying to explain the, the phenomenon really has to uh, also take into account the fact that uh, you, can, you can have this happen on a, on a really rather long, uh, long time scale with essentially the same energy. I think that's really interesting. Oh, sorry. So then the peak power also drops up. The peak power drops correspondingly. The peak power drops by a factor of almost three orders of magnitude. That, that means the peak electron temperature is also dropping by a similar amount. And actually, where you hit the limit here is when the peak electron temperature just barely crosses the Curie temperature for the material. So uh, that, I think, is a uh, is fascinating uh, result. But then does that mean at the very short pulse time, you actually supply more than is needed to heat the electron temperature? Which, which proves that the electron temperature is not the critical parameter for all optical switching. In fact, I think it raises, it raises fundamentally the question is, what is the critical parameter for optical switching? Now, the en it seems to be the energy density, and once you get the uh, once you get to too long of a pulse, the lattice temperature will then exceed the Curie temperature after the, after the process is over. And of course, at that point, you have a multi-domain state. You demagnetize the material. Could it be that we have two parameters? That one dominates in one regime, another dominates in another? Uh, quite possible. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, almost certainly. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So let's move on. So this is good news from the point of view of the application. We could use 10 picosecond pulses. Now you ask, well, how hard is it to get those if I want to do this on an uh, integrated circuit? In a, uh, a CMOS process which, uh, which have no, no uh, variations, as, as we heard before. Well, first thing I want to show you is that on CMOS chips today, in fact, on CMOS chips dating back all the way to 2007, we have picosecond pulses. We already have picosecond pulses. This is data that Intel showed in 2007. And what this shows, it's a little more than we really need to look at. But if we just kind of look, they center their process uh, at a certain off current. And this is the delay. This is the switching time for one single CMOS transistor driving two others. It's a so-called fan out of two uh, ring oscillator gate delay, for those of you who, are, who know about these things. And in the 45 nanometer technology node, you know, we, we just heard we're already in seven today. The gate delay was five picoseconds. If you have a gate delay of five picoseconds, that means there are five picosecond edges running around on this chip. And it's not hard to, build, to make a, a five picosecond duration pulse on chip. And that's in the 45 nanometer node. This is the last time that Intel published data like this. They, they no longer tell you what their gate delays are. But it's not difficult. So the nine picosecond electrical pulse is comparable in its heating duration to this optical pulse. And you can see on, the, on the almost exactly the same time, the magnetization reverses with the electrical heating. Also, very importantly, 
we, we were able to estimate the amount of electrical energy deposited in the gadolinium iron cobalt by measuring the voltage and the current in the, in the pulse. And we calculate that the energy deposited by the electrical pulse is about the same on the order of a millijoule per square centimeter as the optical. So this is consistent with what uh, Moli was talking about earlier. If you scale this down to 20 nanometer size bit, this is a 5 by 5 micron bit that I, that I used in this experiment. But if we take this energy density and scale it down to 20 nanometers, we're talking about femtojoule of uh, switching energy, which is, which is very attractive for on-chip applications. And it, the current would scale down into the range of microamps, which is the amount of current that you can deliver with a single minimum size CMOS transistor, which is what you need for scaling if we were talking about uh, incorporating this on chip. Another really uh, important factor here is uh, the peak current density is actually quite high, almost 10 to the 9 amp per square centimeter. And that might scare those people who work on STT or spin orbit torque memories. You, you would think that, that's way too high and you're going to have all kinds of damage. But I would point out that's the peak, peak current density in a 9 picosecond duration pulse. And uh, we, do this, this, we did these, took this data with a laser with a repetition rate of 250 kilohertz. We run it all day. Um, we did many runs and many uh, experiments. Uh, one sample received over 10 to the 10 uh, switching pulses with no uh, evident degradation. So the answer is you can switch magnetism with a short electrical pulse and get, magnet, uh, get a magnetic device to switch in less than 10 picoseconds. That's, I think, some kind of a record, right? So this is the fastest magnetic switching induced by uh, electronics that uh, I think that's ever been reported. Now, Mo Li in his talk pointed out that if you want to have readout of gadolinium iron cobalt, you have a very low TMR. They did a, a heroic job to make a tunnel junction on gadolinium iron cobalt, but of course, but as he showed, the TMR, the, 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 the mag magneto-resistance ratio was less than a percent. We really want to integrate a ferromagnet uh, Mo suggested exchange coupling a ferromagnet to the gadolinium iron cobalt in order to then have a ferromagnet on which you could build a high TMR tunnel junction. I don't want to take too much time to go into it. We have already demonstrated this. So uh, in this paper that was published last year, we have gadolinium iron cobalt, a platinum uh, spacer layer for exchange coupling, which we could tune by the thickness of the platinum, and then a cobalt platinum ferromagnet on top. And we have lots of data. You can go to this paper. We, this was, we did all optical switching. We haven't switched this electrically yet. That's in the works. But we got the same thing. We got all optical switching of the, of the combined stack. The, the cobalt platinum gets demagnetized by the laser. The gadolinium iron cobalt, we showed convincingly that in this experiment, it wasn't spin current that we could convincingly show that exchange coupling through this RKKY platinum layer, caused the cobalt platinum to then switch as the gadolinium iron co cobalt cools and switches. And then as the cobalt platinum cools, it switches by the exchange coupling to the gadolinium iron cobalt. OK. Now, what I want to spend the rest of my time on is to talk about scaling. I showed some numbers for scaling that were based on estimates. If I could scale down to 20 nanometers, I would have this hero low energy, a hero low switching current. What we're working on now is to try to demonstrate that scaling. And I want to show you the progress that we've made. So the first thing we did was to pattern gadolinium iron cobalt into small dots. And I'm not sure that this is fundamental, but in the materials growth that we were doing, once we got down to less than about one micron, the material loses the perpendicular anisotropy. And so um, this, uh, of course, you really want to do this with perpendicular anisotropy. So we needed a way to uh, deal with this in order to demonstrate scaling down to deep submicron into the nanometer scale. So what we, what we did was uh, we took out the iron 
which, uh, and have higher concentration of cobalt, which helps increase the PMA. And sure enough, pure gadolinium cobalt alloys, scaled down to 200 nanometers, maintain a pretty strong PMA. So this was good news. Uh, and it, uh, it's critical, by the way, to have platinum seed and capping layers in order to uh, maintain this uh, PMA. Now, it's not exactly new to show that we can get all optical switching in gadolinium cobalt. We've uh, seen the uh, bilayer gadolinium cobalt uh, switching results from, um, uh, from uh, Koopman's group. Here is some all optical switching data for gadolinium cobalt alloy nanodots. So here are four micron uh, dots, and you can just barely see in the MOC image the single shot um, switching. But uh, we have arrays of these dots separated by enough so that they're not coupled. And uh, so here's laser MOC data just applying a magnetic field just to uh, calibrate the, um, uh, the MOC signal. And here now we have alternate switching shots with individual laser shots. So at least on a single shot basis, we see toggle switching of this uh, array with uh, essentially what you can see here is the, this is on the same scale. So the, the MOC signal from the all optical switching matches the saturated MOC signal when we uh, uh, make a hysteresis loop with applied magnetic field. So we're getting all optical switching of four micron dots. Actually, um, this is already a five, this is a laser MOC on 500 nanometer dots. Here's the, here's the uh, best we've done so far. These are 200 nanometer dots. You can see they're not perfectly uniform. The, the MOC data is a bit noisy, but it's pretty clear that we're getting toggle switching of these very small dots. So that's, uh, that's good progress. That's, that's what we need in order to you know, make progress towards demonstrating scaling. Here's the latest data that uh, I'm showing here for the first time. This is time-resolved MOC data now on these uh, gadolinium cobalt nanodots. Now, these are arrays, not single dots, so that we can get enough signal. Um, and the dots are spaced by, uh, in each array by about three times the diameter of the dot. And what you see is actually a little bit surprising, but it's good news. As we go from basically a blank, the blanket film and a 15 micron square, that's the blue line. As we go down to smaller and smaller dots, the switching actually gets faster. So here in this um, 200 nanometer dot, that's this orange curve here, we get switching to, full, to all the way to 75% of the saturated value in only two picoseconds. And the puzzle, it's a little bit of a puzzle that it gets faster as the dots get smaller. And um, we have some ideas on that. We started some modeling. Um, uh, I don't want to go too far into it. Uh, we think that uh, by you go to smaller dots, you are starting to confine the phonon, the phonon modes. And I think that has something to do with this. Also, of course, the heat transport out of the dot into the, this is sitting on a silicon substrate. Uh, may also have something to do with this. But in any event, it's, uh, it's good news. And if uh, we project down to a 20 nanometer dot, we are expecting almost complete reversal in only two picoseconds. And this addresses the other issue that uh, Mo Lee brought up in his talk. How soon after you switch once, could you switch again? And uh, he showed data, uh, I think, down to 20 picoseconds. Uh, this suggests that we could probably switch, uh, al do alternate switching even faster um, in, these, in these nanodots, but that has yet to be demonstrated. Okay, so uh, I want to stop uh, so that we can all have dinner. Um, what I've, uh, I just want to summarize, we've demonstrated ultra-fast picosecond all-electronic switching in a magnetic material. I think this really opens up a whole new regime for ultra-fast spintronics. You know, the hot topic at a lot of the conference, this conference and previous ultra-fast magnetism conferences is, is terahertz. We're doing on-chip terahertz ultra-fast magnetism. And I think a lot of possibilities open up by going on-chip. 
And uh, also, I think we can see uh, our way through to uh, practical applications for ultrafast magnetism in this regime. Uh, I just want to say a few words about where we're headed. So what we really want to do is demonstrate the scaling. So step one was to just see if we could make nanodots switch optically. But what we really want to do is measure the switching current of a single dot to see if, indeed, uh, the scaling that we would estimate holds true in, in experiments. So we want to integrate the electrical switching of the nanodots. And then, of course, we have to have a way to read them out. One single 50 nanometer dot, I'm not going to read that out optically not without some really heroic effort. Instead, what we plan to do is to adopt our strip line uh, geometry. Here you see at the center, here's the center conductor. The, the nano dot will be at the center of a Hall cross. So that, uh, and we've already uh, been able to successfully align a uh, Hall cross to a 50 nanometer dot of gadolinium cobalt. And we do have data on uh, you know, measuring Hall signals from those uh, dots, but we still haven't done the switching, uh, electrical switching yet. But that's, that's our, uh, our near-term plan. We have a lot of ideas on how to improve, make more complicated magnetic stacks in order to further reduce the switching current. That will be, that will be good. And more importantly is to get rid of the toggling. So can we figure out a way to switch, not just by alternate every single shot, but on demand. I want a one, I want a zero, I want a zero, I want a one. Uh, we have ideas on how we can actually do that ultra fast. And uh, that's another near-term experiment. And then finally, uh, we are working with uh, colleagues who get access to this high-performance foundry CMOS. We want to actually integrate, once we demonstrate that we can indeed scale down the switching current to that which could be delivered on chip by a CMOS transistor, we're going to actually try and do that. And uh, shut up all of the doubters who say, well, you still even have a laser. So we want to completely get rid of the laser and uh, show that we can do ultra-fast switching on chip. And uh, so thanks, and uh, let's go home.